So the most interesting data released at ASCO G was probably the data for Keynote 564. Uh, to me, it, it was a really monumental achievement to see in this clinical trial, which randomized patients with high-risk renal cell carcinoma to receive either pembrolizumab or placebo, a difference in overall survival. Uh, this is a huge landmark in the field and the first time, to my knowledge, that we've actually seen an overall survival benefit with adjuvant immunotherapy. So I think this is a really tremendous milestone and one certainly to be celebrated. Um, you know, there were lots of comments and critiques around, for instance, the fact that there was not crossover onto immunotherapy in many patients, but that really reflects the reality of the disease process and that at the time of metastasis, many times we just simply continue observation or we do local definitive therapies. So in my opinion, the data that was presented for Checkmate 9ER with further follow-up really reinforced that as being one of our preferred approaches for patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. You know, in my opinion, the data that pertains to both progression-free survival and overall survival really held for the most part. You're starting to see some crossover on the tail end of the survival curves. Uh, but having said that, I think by and large, you're seeing that most patients still derive benefit, perhaps to a greater extent than what we're seeing in the context of trials like Keynote 426 and the CLEAR study. So I think that uh, cabozantinib with the volumab remains a very good upfront choice for patients. And of course, we've seen before, and it was reinforced at this meeting, subset analysis data suggesting that there's specific activity in the context of patients, for instance, with bony metastases, or for instance, disease that migrates towards the liver and other organs. So when you look at IMDC risk stratification, for instance, in the context of Checkmate 9 ER, what really holds is that patients who have favorable risk seem to perhaps derive less benefit. And, you know, it's this constant struggle that we have in renal cell carcinoma to understand what the best therapy is in this population. You know, patients with favorable risk disease, many do need therapy, some perhaps don't. And I would imagine that there's probably a subset of individuals that were over-treating. You know, having said that, what's always sort of pointed out and what has been from the get-go is that if we use monotherapy, there are patients who go on to progress early on. And that's really what we want to avoid, because when that happens, we know that we probably compromise overall survival in those patients. Um, and I wish there was a better way for us to know who we could de-escalate therapy in. But for the time being, I, my personal suggestion is that patients with favorable risk disease probably uh, need to get doublet therapy. So the quality of life data from Checkmate 9 ER, I think really sort of stands out in the pack as being quite unique. We see that there is a substantial benefit across several metrics for quality of life, and that's different from the Keynote 426 or from the CLEAR studies. And to me, it's just really a reflection of what we feel to be the case in the sense that with studies like CLEAR, we're using doses of lenvatinib that are much higher than we think most patients can tolerate, 20 milligrams, for instance. Um, in the Checkmate 9 ER study, we actually de-escalated the dose of cabozantinib that we use in the second line setting and beyond from 60 milligrams to 40 milligrams. And I think that makes all the difference in the world in terms of qual uh, tolerability and subsequently quality of life. You know, the Checkmate 67T trial is one that evaluated subcutaneous versus intravenous nivolumab. It showed, in my mind, balanced outcomes, although it wasn't really powered as a non-inferiority study. You know, having said that, I do think that if we can potentially effectively deliver uh, therapy subcutaneously, it's going to be a huge um, blessing for our, our very busy clinics. You know, I'm always struggling at my center. I'm sure this is true for others as well, to find space in infusion clinics for patients that urgently need to start therapy. Uh, being able to render therapy subcutaneously really changes that. One of the best presentations that I attended in the RCC section, and I will confess I'm a little biased, was from one of my former mentees, uh, Dr. Christiane Bergerow. And she's been working really hard to refine quality of life metrics for kidney cancer. And she's been doing this by um, really uh, taking a look at existing studies, talking to patients and seeing whether or not they can potentially offer some perspective on what components of quality of life metrics are meaningful versus not. 
Um, and she's distilled pages and pages of surveys that we offer to patients into just sort of a narrow spectrum of 10 to 15 questions that I, I think really gets at key questions pertaining to quality of life and might limit is really sort of survey burden amongst patients. I think we're kind of getting to a place in kidney cancer that we were in several years ago where we generally speaking have, you know, just two or three various mechanisms to treat the disease. We have our VEGF inhibitors and downstream of that Belzutifan, and we've got immune checkpoint inhibitors. But what we really, I think, desperately need are treatments and strategies that, you know, really differ from that. So in the context of phase one clinical trials, I'm exploring CAR-T therapies and a multitude of other treatments that I think are on the horizon that could be of interest. So we've recently launched a trial looking at CTX-131, which is a CD70-directed CAR-T therapy. Um, we've launched trials looking at um, multiple other um, antigens that are unique to renal cell, like ENPV3, using BITE. Uh, based therapies, for instance. So I think all of these therapies hold a great deal of promise, and I look forward to using them down the line. 